Okay. Well, thank you so much for that extended int introduction there. Uh, I think you know quite a lot about me at this point. So let's just uh, go straight into the talk. Um, so yeah, ZK Actus, uh, verifiable financial contracts. Um, ZK stands for zero knowledge, uh, which is an advanced form of cryptography that is really now coming into kind of production systems. ACTA stands for Algorithmic Contract Type Unified Standard, which is an emerging financial standard coming out of the kind of field of economics. And so during the course of this presentation, I want to uh, kind of uh, communicate to you how we at the Casper Network use this ACTUS uh, financial framework as a focalizing use case for our R&D efforts. Um, so you already know all this about me, so there's no point talking <laughs> again. Okay, so the first part of the talk is going to focus very much on Actus. Uh, so it's an emerging uh, financial standard. Um, and let's kind of switch to the, um, the let's get, move that out of the way, uh, the, the Actus Foundation's website. So um, Actus as a standard emerged in 2009, 2010 in response to the global financial crisis uh, that was caused by, uh, if, you, if you recall, the opacity of portfolios of subprime mortgages. So they kind of, you know, financial engineers had uh, kind of constructed these portfolios of uh, fairly low-grade mortgages and then built derivatives products on top of that. Uh, and the end result was that nobody could really understand what was inside these portfolios. And in actual fact, they were ended up as high risk and fairly toxic uh, kind of asset bases. And, you know, we had an implosion event. It almost brought down the US banking system. So in response to, to that, uh, that, that crisis, a group of economists, uh, academics, um, uh, people from the private sector came together. In particular, the Alan Mendelovitz, who's, who's up here, and Vili Bramertz. So Vili Bramertz uh, is a Swiss-based economist. He's very much the intellectual architect of this standard. And Alan Mendelovitz holds the record for the most congressional hearings in, in, uh, in Congress um, and was former chairman of the Federal Housing Finance Board. So these are serious, serious people coming together to propose this framework. So let's kind of like explore the framework a little bit. So what Actus provides is a taxonomy of financial contract types. So if you look at this infographic, you can read it from the top downwards. Um, and from the top, you've got a classification schema. So you know, it says financial contracts, basic fixed income maturities down towards the left, or financial contracts, combined derivatives, options, plain vanilla, They're following another pathway. This is a classification schema. And if you look from the bottom upwards, you can see these uh, these boxes with these capitalized acronyms, and these are the, each of the individual financial contract types that this standard supports. Now, these are uh, composable, so you can like issue a contract in, in isolation. For example, uh, here we have a PAM, principal at maturity, which you could use to run a mortgage, for example, or you can compose them into what's called a structured product or a structured instrument. So you could imagine a stock option with a swap. So stock option swap. So you get these kind of permutations and combinations. So this is like at a very high level uh, what the standard brings you. It's unifying the universe of financial contracts. And if you think about it, financial contracts are at the heart of finance. So, okay, this is actually interesting. Now, what's unique about this standard is not that it's a taxonomy, because there are other taxonomies, it's not that each of the contract types has machine-readable terms associated with it, which is a very useful property, but the key thing is that each of the contract types are associated with a clearly defined set of algorithms. And it's the algorithmic dimension of this standard which is actually truly unique. Um, this standard has just been adopted by ISO, which implies that it's going to be, uh, you know, that, it, that it's, it's going to be a real thing. So we're really at an inflection point in the evolution of this standard. So um, that's kind of like the higher level. Uh, let's just look into these algorithms a, a little bit. If you, if you click, go to the home page, you can see these technical specifications. If I open those up, here is the, the kind of uh, white paper for that. 
And uh, the white paper will talk about uh, kind of different mathematical notations, a whole set of utility functions that need to be specified for each of the financial contract types. And then it gives you the algorithms for each supported contract type. So in this case, we have the PAM, principal and maturity, which as I said, you could use to run a mortgage. And you've got a whole set of mathematical notations there. It's not formal mathematics, but it, it's, it's you know, semi-formalized. Um, and so, you know, you coming to this standard, you've kind of got some information here that you can use to, to implement it if you want, but we're kind of missing uh, some aspects, and that's uh, the, the metadata, i.e. Uh, in Actus Talk, they call it the, the data dictionary. So the, the economists came together over a series of workshops using a kind of spreadsheet. They put they specified the metadata associated with the contract types. So here's the declaration of the set of contract types, and then here's the superset of contract terms, and then here's scoping of those contract terms in the context of a type, contract type. And then lastly, this is what's called the event, so contract events, which we're gonna return to a little bit later. But, um, you know, so the, the, the economists came together and collectively defined the standard, defined the mathematics behind the standard. Is this going? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> is that better? Not really. So what do I need to do? It's a display yeah. problem, yeah. It's a display problem. We are not setting properly. Okay, if I go to settings. Okay, anyway, let's just keep going because otherwise uh, we'll lose, run out of time. Okay, so um, you just have to bear with me and all these slides will be available online afterwards anyway. But the, the whole point is that the economists come together, they've specified the mathematics, they've specified the taxonomy, they've specified the machine readable terms associated with the contract types, um, and they give you uh, like a demonstration application that you can uh, that you can use, which one we'll go to now. And for example, for an annuity, we can just pull down an example test. Here we have a fixed term loan, uh, and we can just go and ask the Actus calculation engine to go and tell us what is the payment schedule for that loan. Okay, so this is the inputs into our system. We're saying, okay, how do we take this standard and then do something useful with it and amplify this standard across the, the blockchain space? If you think about what the blockchain space brings you until now, really it's like currencies, NFTs, etc., fairly simplistic financial instruments. We wanna take this up a much higher level and do some real world finance. So um, let's pivot back into my slide deck and just make one note about the algorithms that the inputs are these machine readable term sets. They are composable and heterogeneous, but the outputs are so-called event sequences. And these you may kind of equip, they're equivalent to cash flows and they're homogenous. Uh, I can show you, uh, this is an example term set. And so yeah, just machine readable information specifying the terms of a financial contract. Uh, here's the output of the algorithms, the event sequence, which you can use to for to, as input into a cash uh, payments engine. Okay, so right here, right now, there's several implementations of this uh, Actus framework. There's Java, Rust, Haskell, Python, TypeScript, and R, and they're all standalone binaries that useful uh, in and of themselves, 
but you know, how can we bring these, uh, uh, this standard into the DLT space? Well, you take Actus, you add zero knowledge plus distributed ledger technology, and then you have this concept, verifiable financial contracts. There's three pillars to this solution, uh, integrity, tokenization, and payments. So most of you have heard about tokenization in the context of blockchain systems. You've probably heard about payment systems, whether in like fiat uh, environments or blockchain environments, but maybe uh, we can drill down a little bit into the integrity dimension. So from the actor standard, the artifacts that come out of, of using or utilizing that standard in, in an operational sense are the counterparties who come to an agreement over a financial contract, the term set associated with a financial contract, the algorithm used to der der derive the cash flows associated with the financial contract and those cash flows. So these are the actor-specific artifacts. Now we can take uh, cryptographic proofs over those artifacts. So, you know, fairly simple cryptographic proofs, signatures, uh, attestations, uh, fingerprints, i.e. hashing functions, and now we can use ZK proofs uh, to give us uh, some insight into the correctness of the computational um, dimension of running the algorithms. And I'm going to drill down into that a little bit later on. So all those proofs we can have put onto a, a blockchain uh, via a smart contract mechanism so we can signal that for any particular issued uh, financial contract, here is the uh, truth or the integrity of that contract. Now, terms uh, are mutable over time. So these financial contracts are dynamic. So typically, there will be environmental triggers, such as an interest rate change, that results in a new term set. And therefore, you need to go and hit the algorithms again because the cash flows have changed. And therefore, you need to post on-chain the new set of cryptographic proofs. Similarly, if a counterparty defaults, this would be a behavioral trigger, this also results in a change in the term set, therefore once again you have to hit the algorithm, recalculate the cash flows, and resubmit these proofs on chain. So these are dynamic financial contracts and the proof sets in themselves are dynamic as a result. So this is like the first pillar of this kind of solution space. Uh, the second pillar, as I said earlier, is tokenization. Uh, so, for each financial contract, we can mint a so-called uh, VFC token, which is simply tracking the counterparty exposure over time to that financial contract. Um, if, in the case of a commercial bond, for example, you typically you may have, um, let's say, three banks issuing a bond. Let's say it's $200 uh, million bond, commercial bond, issued by three banks to a commercial entity, let's say, IBM, for example. So, you know, you may have uh, Bank A has, is contributing 100 million, Bank B and Bank C 50 million, and then IBM is taking that on the other side. So, uh, you know, so on one side of the contract, you have three counterparties. On the other side of the contract, you have one counterparty. So we can kind of, um, in as the top part of the tokenization process, we uh, post on-chain the, these kind of ratios of exposure by the counterparties, and those uh, counterparty sets themselves are mutable. So for example, Bank C could sell their uh, allotment to Bank D, and now you've, you know, you've, you've changed the counterparties on that side of the contract. Or maybe IBM could one day be taken over, and therefore, or be part of a merger, so maybe you know, it may sell its aspect of the uh, financial contract to a, another counterparty. So counterparty sets are mutable over time. All this information can be posted on chain. Um, and then auditors, rate, ratings agencies, regulators can query uh, the chain in order to uh, understand uh, what are the counterparties, what are their exposure to these financial contracts. And then you can kind of incubate secondary markets to allow exchanges or transfers between counterparties. So that's kind of part of the tokenization modality. Uh, of these financial contracts. And the third pillar here is the um, kind of putting together a, a payments engine to process the cash flows themselves. So typically for a cash flow or an event sequence, we know the timestamps, we know the direction, we know the amounts, denomination, 
we know the obligor, the set of obligors, and we can put that information into a payments engine which will uh, use verification mechanisms uh, prior to opening, closing, servicing payment channels, etc., managing defaults, sending notifications, and we can use a DLT or, or, or blockchain uh, smart contracts in order to, to record information and also to orchestrate um, uh, like behavior amongst distributed uh, actors. So that's the kind of three pillars of, of our kind of solution, um, but there's some principles. And you know, one principle we, we follow is Occam's razor. So blockchain networks are very bad uh, like places to put data. You, know, you do not want to put large amounts of data on a blockchain. So you want to put as little as possible, as much as necessary, hence why we only submit proofs uh, to the chain. We want to incubate a system that's chain agnostic. So yes, I work for the Casper network, but we want to create a system that's going to be amplified across the blockchain space. Um, privacy pre preserving. So, you know, privacy is dynamic. It's like who can see what, when, and why. Um, so we absolutely need to respect that. Uh, trust but verify. Proofs are the foundation of this system. Cryptographic proofs. Oh, that is. Now, we have challenges for building such a system. Uh, first of all, regulatory certitude. So in the previous talk, uh, Ramesh uh, gave you a, a slide where he kind of, you know, there was white areas, red areas, green, yellow, whatever, indicating that on a, if you take a kind of global perspective, the regulation around uh, DLT in particular is, is fairly, um, let's say, heterogeneous. So that's an issue. Uh, counterparty risk. At the heart of Actus is our financial contracts and counterparties. And managing counterparty risk is an ongoing activity. Uh, anything we do must be post-quantum post secure. Uh, jurisdictional anchoring. Uh, this is a, a, the notion that no financial contract is issued in a jurisdictional vacuum. Uh, so we really need a system of kind of like smart legal contracts to, it, to support what we're doing and then managing technological flux over time uh, is, is important because we want to build like a multi-decadal system. We really want to be able to uh, allow an open source uh, platform of platforms for issuing, managing, servicing financial contracts, plus also running uh, simulations over portfolios, risk simulations over portfolios so that you get much more insight into the risk dimension of, of what's happening in the real uh, financial world, uh, which, as I said earlier, is why this actor standard came about in the first place. So, uh, part three of the talk, let's, and this is gonna be way more interesting for you guys as cryptographers uh, and um, professionals in the space. You know, at the heart of, of why we are so interested in using zero knowledge proofs is, is computational integrity, right? We, we know that um, you know, the system is algorithmic based. We've got to ensure that, and, and that we have a clear signal that the, the computation of those cash flows uh, was correctly performed. And so we can use zero knowledge techniques uh, for that. So just kind of you know, reinforcing that these Actus algorithms you know, run in a zero knowledge compute space will give us these uh, zero knowledge proofs. So, you know, what are ZK proofs? Well, ultimately, you know, you take a, a kind of functional predicate and which has public inputs X and private inputs Y, typically called the witness, and we simply want to know, you know, without having to reveal any other information, uh, whether the function uh, evaluated to true or false in a very simple way. Uh, the properties of ZK proofs that are super important for us are succinctness, so they should be compact. You know, the compute may be expensive, but the, uh, and the proof may be expensive to, 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 to compute, but the proof itself, the proof size must be small. Um, the reason why we can get succinctness is because ZK proofs are probabilistic. You know, they are not fully deterministic, they are probabilistic, but at a very high level of probability. probability. Secondly, soundness, that is an honest prover and an honest verifier will come to agreement over the validity of a proof. Uh, as I said, they are expensive to compute. So typically, let's say if a, uh, um, if a, a computation takes, let's say, n uh, CPU cycles, 
then once you put a kind of zero knowledge into the, I into the mix, then you've got several orders of magnitude more uh, CPU cycles. It could be 10N, could be 20N, whatever. Uh, but uh, whilst they're expensive to compute, they are cheap to verify. So these proofs can be passed around and verified very, very quickly. So you know those properties are essential to, to the robustness and the ability for ZK proofs, uh, proving systems right here, right now to be used in production systems. Uh, the kind of elements of zero-knowledge cryptography are arithmetic circuits um, and then uh, introducing constraint systems over those arithmetic uh, circuits, uh, mapping those constraints to polynomials and then creating polynomial commitments um, over those uh, polynomials. So uh, those are kind of cryptographic elements of most zero knowledge proving systems. But from a development perspective, um, like your average engineer is going to be inter interacting not with these cryptographic foundational elements, but with higher level uh, kind of software uh, like artifacts. So virtual machines. So there are a wave of zero knowledge virtual machines coming on stream. Uh, you know, kind of VM design has really been uh, a very fertile landscape in the last 18 months, two years. Um, embedded DSLs, so programming low-level circuits uh, is error-prone and, uh, you know, you, you need very high skill levels to be able to do them uh, successfully. So um, having domain-specific languages really help to allow your average engineer, let's say, still skilled, but not like super skilled, uh, to actually be productive in this space. Um, Roll-ups are a mechanism that's used, that are being used in the blockchain space to scale. So rather than pushing all transactions into the layer one, we can create these so-called layer two systems called roll-ups, and transactions are pushed through the roll-ups, and then the computational proofs are posted onto the L1 for verification. So it's kind of a, like a new desi design modality. Uh, and then lastly, we have applications. And of course, ZK Actus is itself an application. So I just want to give you a little uh, kind of tour of uh, what's, you know, some of the kind of uh, interesting um, projects in the uh, ZK space right now. So uh, this is, first thing to say is like, there's an awful lot of information out there now. Like two years ago, it was pretty difficult to skill up, but nowadays it's a lot easier to skill up. Um, so you've got Medium as, as, a, as a channel. You know, there's lots and lots of information out there, detailed information about the low level uh, kind of cryptographic uh, processes involved in, in um, generating these proofs for any particular computation. Uh, you've got like uh, knowledge bases, like awesome zero knowledge proofs is a good one that uh, I like myself. Um, podcasts, so zero knowledge .fm, like it's on episode 291. It's like a weekly thing. So this has been going for a couple of years. This is a great uh, resource uh, for those who want to get up to speed with not only zero knowledge, but also applications of zero knowledge, particularly in the kind of blockchain uh, dimension. Uh, then we have conferences, so, you know, you know, dedicated conferences. The next, like, big one will be ZK Summit 10 in London in September. Um, all these conferences are, uh, like, streamed, so, you know, you don't need to be there to attend, right? Um, Low-level circuit systems, there's several, like, frameworks out there. The kind of mother of all frameworks was called CIRCOM, that's now at CIRCOM uh, 2. So this is like a DSL for writing low-level circuits. Uh, like behind the scenes, basically your, your, your code is being mapped to, to highly complex um, uh, kind of cryptographic circuitry. Um, but uh, you, know, you can write in this kind of higher level language called CIRCOM. Um, Arcworks is a Rust-based ecosystem for so-called SNARK programming. Uh, you, you know, if you get involved in any kind of uh, real way with, with what's happening in the ZK space, you will come up against uh, Arcworks at some point. Um, Plonky 3, so this is uh, like the third uh, iteration of so-called Plonky proving systems, and this really is cutting edge. Like this is, if you look at the commits on, on this, this is like 
last week, you know, two days ago, um, our team, my R&D team at the Casper Network, we will be uh, leveraging this particular proving system over the course of the next year. Um, Valida, so I spoke a little bit about virtual machines. Uh, there's several uh, like Stark-based virtual machines for running computation. The interesting thing about Valida, apart from just being like real cutting edge, like this is like, you know, commits two weeks ago, yes, yesterday, yada, yada, is that uh, in using Valida, you can write your code in C++, Rust, C or whatever, and use standard co uh, compiler chains, uh, and then the, the uh, bytecode can be interpreted by the VM. So that's actually interesting. Um, Maiden virtual machines, another Stark-based virtual machines, super interesting. If you actually look at the code base, it's a very, very clean implementation. So if, you, if you're kind of Rust aficionados, you will appreciate this project simply from just looking at the source code. It's so you know, well-constructed and clean. Um, Snark VM, yet another uh, virtual machine. So you know, one of the messages here is that not only is you know, an awful lot of investment in terms of monetary uh, investment, but also time and engineering investment is being put into these systems and virtual machines are kind of uh, where uh, you know, most of you will, come, uh, will, will kind of be porting your applications into. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, you know, it embedded domain-specific languages really streamline the process of getting up to speed with uh, porting your application into a ZK space. So here's, here's a, a language called Leo from the Alio project. Uh, here's another one called Noir from the Aztec project. So, you know, very much both, both of these have kind of Rust-like semantics, but they're, they're, they're high-level languages which compile to the um, bytecode that the, the associated virtual machines can interpret. Uh, and lastly, I just want to, to kind of bring your attention to the fact that um, these, these virtual machines or the circuit systems, they're going to be uh, running on, on hardware and we're seeing special purpose hardware coming into, uh, into existence. So this is a company called Fabric of Truth. I was at Stanford last week. We had a, a conversation about uh, porting some of our work onto specialized hardware because you know, running the mathematics of the cryptography, uh, there's an awful lot of optimization that you can do at the hardware level. So you're seeing so-called VPUs, or verifiable processing units, or sometimes they're called ZPUs, zero knowledge processing units. And these are coming on stream. This company had a $50 million investment just recently uh, by a, a Bitcoin mining company, actually. So they want to pivot into this space. So, um, so that was just like a, a brief tour of you know what ZK proofs are at a fairly high level, but also where this we are right here, right now in this space. It's very fertile, very active, very dynamic. Um, so going back to, to, to my talk, really what I'm proposing here is a holistic end-to-end -end system for financial contracts and for verifiable financial contracts, which is actually a new thing in the world. Um, and we really want to do this, A, because the tech is available for us, uh, B, because this standard, that you know, this actor standard, which is being fast-tracked by ISO, is, is available to us. Uh, but most importantly is that we want to make a contribution, and this comes from my membership of the Central Bank Research Association. We want to make a contribution to improving the uh, financial stability of, of global financial systems by, uh, and we want to, we're, we're doing that by, by introducing this notion of verifiable financial contracts. So you should be able to, for any particular financial contract, be given a set of zero knowledge proofs that you can verify and we will give you confidence that the cash flows associated with that financial contract are correct. And therefore you will have much more confidence in the, uh, the, the portfolios that are constructed upon uh, you know, the, the, the financial contracts within those portfolios. So at that, I will say thank you and invite any questions.
हेलो थैंक यू फॉर वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉक आई एम इंटरेस्टेड फॉर माय परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ रिसर्च एंड द एप्लीकेशन ऑफ लर्निंग कंप्यूटर डेटा इंटेंसिव एप्लीकेशन ऑन डीटेल टास्क्स एंड आई आई एम बिटली इंटरेस्टेड इन दिस एरिया आल्सो गिवन इट्स वेरी कन्विंसिंग इन द एप्लीकेशन फॉर द फाइनेंशियल इंडस्ट्री एंड फॉर बिजनेस लॉजिक what is your perspective on data and computer intensive applications so like machine learning kind of yeah. applications for example um already well it, uh, already you see the limitations yeah the limitations yeah scaling like how you know like i one of my backgrounds is in um i i work for climate change research institute and we do very large scale simulations of climate models I don't see those models running in on zero knowledge compute spaces. They're extremely like horizontal compute problems, right? And so um yeah, I don't see those kind of problem spaces. Large scale machine learning, I don't see those problem spaces necessarily. Uh but there are ZK ML as uh, zero knowledge ML groups kind of emerging. So uh it's unclear to me exactly what will be the limits. Um at this point in time um what i will say in, in the context of actus like hitting the algorithms is fairly quick it is completely within scope but what is interesting is when you're trying to do portfolio wide simulations of for example running monte carlo simulations i mean you would really want a zero knowledge proof of your monte carlo simulation but as you say you know it's still not clear what are the limits of the of these systems yeah good question Does that answer your question? Yes, I think it's not clear in general yeah. what the limits are, but yeah. for uh, let's say processing gigabytes of data, processing of their data at the moment, like yeah. you know, I don't know, it's yeah. it's yeah, that's that's exactly that's my that's that's my point. Yeah. 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 Yeah.